we're looking at four time prophecies or four prophecies that are within the 2300 year prophecy. In our last presentation, we considered the first of those prophecies, the first 49 years of the 2300 years. Um, in this presentation, we're going to try to note two of them, the 490 and the 2300 years itself. I'm going to step outside of my notes and just do this from Daniel chapter 8 in the beginning. So if you just set your notes aside, I will refer to a, perhaps one or two points in the notes as we go through Daniel 8 so you can see the definition of the word cleansed when we get there and the definition of the word that is translated as days in verse 14 of Daniel 8. But in Daniel 8, if you're not familiar with it, in the English, there are ten places where the word vision occurs, but the Hebrew words that are translated as vision are two different Hebrew words. One is chauzon, the other is mare, and they mean two different things. But they're both translated as vision, so when you read Daniel 8, you're going to see the word vision ten times, but if you don't take the trouble to make the distinction on which of these Hebrew words is found in the particular places, you miss a lot of important information. So if this is the first time through for you, you'll notice that in verse 1 of Daniel 8, in the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision. You see vision there, and in verse 2 it says, and I saw in a vision, and towards the end of the verse it says, I saw in a vision. And then if you jump forward to verse 13, it says, how long shall be the vision? And then in verse 15 it says, and it came to pass when I, even I, Daniel, had seen the vision. And in verse 16 it says, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. And in verse 17, it says at the end of the verse, at the time of the end shall be the vision. And in verse 26, it says the vision of the evenings and mornings which was told is true. Wherefore, shut thou up the vision. It's two times in that verse. And in the last verse, verse 27, towards the end it says, I was astonished at the vision. So if you count those up, you'll see the English word vision ten times. But it's not the same word. Okay, sometimes it's chow zone, which means complete. Um, the complete vision, or sometimes it's mare, which means appearance. In fact, if you look at verse um, 15, verse 15 of Daniel 8 says that it came to pass when I, even I, Daniel, had seen the vision and sought for meaning, then behold, there stood before me as the appearance, where it says as the appearance this word that is translated as appearance is the Hebrew word mare, and the meaning is appearance. Okay. So, I could go through and tell you which verses are the chosen vision and which are the mare. That's helpful, but we're not going to get to that level. I just want you to see, to start with, that these two Hebrew words are both translated as vision, because I want to make a couple points based upon this understanding. In verse 26... You have both of these words. The first vision in verse 26 is the Mare vision, and the second is the Chauzon. And it says, And the Mare vision, the appearance vision of the evening and morning which is told, which was told is true, wherefore shut up thou the Chauzon vision, for it shall be for many days. So there's things to teach about that verse, but what I want you to see is that the Mare vision. And the Mari vision of the evening and morning, that the Mari vision is the vision of the evening and morning. That's what it's defined as in verse 26. And in your notes, on um, page 20 of your notes, uh, maybe it's not page 20, yeah, it's page 20. Under, in a third down in your page, it says days, and then it says evening and morning. The two Hebrew words in the scriptures that are translated as evening and morning are Arab and Boger. And everywhere that Arab and Boger occur in God's word, it's translated as evening and morning. 
and the evening and morning were the first day, and the evening and the morning were the second day. This is Arab and Bogar. And in verse 26, when it says, the Mari vision of the Arab and the Bogar, of the evening and morning, which is told you is true, what it's telling you is that the Mari vision, the Mari vision up here, that this is the vision of the Arab and the Bogar. This is the vision of the evening and morning. Okay, maybe that doesn't seem important for you to understand at this point, but I want you to see that. Whatever the Mari vision is, it's the vision of the evening and morning. And everywhere in the Bible that Arab and Bogar are translated, they're translated as evening and morning except for one verse. And the one verse where they're not translated as evening and morning has to be, happens to be the central pillar and foundation of Adventism. It's Daniel 8.14. So this doesn't mean a whole lot, but it does seem to be a specific distinction that the Holy Spirit guided the translators of the Bible to make. It's making an emphasis on Daniel 8.14 that if you pass over it, you probably won't see the emphasis. The only place in the whole Word of God where Arab and Bogar is translated differently than evening and morning is Daniel 8.14. And what Daniel 8.26 tells us is that the vision of the evening and mornings, that that's the Mare vision. Okay, so Daniel 8.14, where it says under 2300 days, that Hebrew word translated as days is evening and morning, under 2300 evenings and mornings. And what I'm wanting you to see, and I'm not saying I understand everything about this verse, I know that I don't, but what I'm wanting you to see is that the Holy Spirit is telling us that the vision of the 2300 days is the Mare vision. Okay, it's the Mare vision, it's not the Chao's own vision. Okay, the Chao's own vision is the complete vision. In, in my definition, which I'm prepared to defend, I'm not going to defend, but I have reasons for making this definition. The Chalzon vision is the vision of prophetic history. Okay, the vision of prophetic history, of the sequence of events. That's the Chalzon vision. This vision, the Mari vision, if you trace it through the scriptures, it's the vision that Daniel has in chapter 10, and Isaiah has in chapter 6, and Ezekiel has in chapter 2 and 10, and that John has in the Revelation. It's the appearance of Christ when he appears to these prophets, and they're humbled into the dust. Their comeliness turns to corruption. That's the Mari vision. It's what allows Christ to then tell them to stand up and purify their lips with a coal from off the altar that they can take a message to his people. Okay, this, this vision has to do with your personal Christian experience. It's the vision that each one of us has to have by moving into the most holy place Amen. and having a personal experience with Jesus Christ where we realize that our comeliness is worthless and we surrender it before him at the foot of the cross that he can take the gadol out of us and fill us with his spirit and change us into his image. In Isaiah 6, when this happens to Isaiah, Isaiah then hears the question, whom shall I send? Do you remember that story in Isaiah 6? And what does Isaiah say? See, that's part of it, send me, but what's the first part? Let's go to Isaiah 6. This is always a danger for me to not stick on my notes. <laughs> we don't know that we have time. Uh, how long this will take. Okay, in verse um, 8. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and whom will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. Okay, this is the response of the prophets. More than one prophet makes this response. And his response is, Here am I, send me. Where's the first place you see this response? Okay, if you read the Spirit of Prophecy, when the plan of redemption is being drawn up, the question comes up, whom can we send? Can't send an angel. And who, who makes this volunteer? Jesus. And what does he say? Here I am, send me. The prophets always say, here am I, send me. But Jesus said, here I am, send me. Who's I am? But when the prophet says, here am I, send me, what are they saying? What's that representing here when Isaiah says that? that he's manifested the character of Christ. Right? That's what that's representing. He's, he's moved into the most holy place, 
And this is the most holy place experience. You know that in Isaiah 6. How do you know that? Go to Isaiah 6, just to back up a few verses. In verse 3 of Isaiah 6, it's when Isaiah is seeing the glory of the Lord, in verse 3, the seraphims are saying this, And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Do all the prophets agree with one another? Yep. When is the whole earth full of God's glory? 18. Revelation 18. So when Isaiah is being humbled into the dust by the glory of the Lord, where is he seeing the glory? In the most holy place at the beginning of the judgment of the living. And by having this experience, which you and I are to have, by having this appearance presented to us in the most holy place, we're humbled into the dust, our comeliness is turned into corruption and he raises us up, takes a coal off the altar and purifies our lips so we can carry a message to God's people. That's Isaiah 6. Amen? Amen. So then what does the Lord do in Isaiah 7? He identifies what the message is. And what's the, the message of Isaiah 7? Well, it's the 2520. Amen. Okay, that's what we showed you this morning. It's the 2520. But that's not what we're looking at here. The Mari vision is the vision of appearance. The Chazon vision is the vision of prophetic history. If you go back to Daniel 8... In verse 3, in verse 3 of Daniel 8, he begins to see this vision. It says, Then I lifted up mine eyes and saw, and behold, there stood before the river a ram. Okay, so he's going to see the vision of prophetic history. This vision here is the Chalazon vision. And in verse 3, he begins to see the vision of prophetic history that begins with the Medes and the Persians. And by the time it gets to verse 12, it says, And a host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression, and it cast down the truth to the ground, and it practiced, and it prospered. The vision of prophetic history comes to an end here. You, you might argue that verse 13 is part of it. I don't know that I would argue that. But after he sees the sequence of prophetic events from verses 3 through 12, then he hears a heavenly dialogue in verse 13. It says, Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint, and do you have a marginal reference for that certain saint? If you do, it says Palmoni. This is the name of Christ. He's the wonderful numberer, the numberer of secrets. And thus Christ is represented here in Daniel 8, 13 and 14. You can't separate verse 13 from verse 14. You can, they do it, but you can't. Because verse 13 is a question and verse 14 is the answer. And you separate them at, uh, to your own detriment. And what we're to understand, at least a little bit of what we're to understand, is that the person that is associating himself with this question and answer here is Palmona. It's Christ when he's emphasizing his control of the time prophecies and of time in God's word. Okay, so once we know that it's the certain saint which spake, the question is, is how long? And it doesn't say when. It says, how long? The question is about duration. If it was about a point in time, it would be when. Okay, now the, the modern theologians of Adventism insist that this, this Hebrew that's translated in this verse as how long, that you can find instances in God's word where these same Hebrew words are translated as when. So what? The translators of the King James Bible translated it as how long. And it's not simply Hebrew, brothers and sisters. This question, how long, is a prophetic subject. Amen. In the fifth seal, the, the souls under the altar, they raise the question, how long? Okay, in Zechariah 1, the question is raised, how long until you have mercy upon Jerusalem? This is a prophetic symbol. This question, how long, it's always the same question. And it's several places in God's word. And based upon looking at it as a prophetic symbol, it's about duration. It's not about a point in time. Because so the question is about duration. It says, how long shall be the Chowzone vision? This is the vision of prophetic history. How long shall be the Chowzone vision concerning the daily? And we won't put sacrifice in there because in early writings, page 74, Ellen White says the word sacrifice here was added by human wisdom and does not belong to the text. It's the only added word in God's word that Ellen White informs us does not belong there. So the question is, how long shall be the vision concerning the daily and the transgression of desolation? Two entities, 
and they're going to do something. They're going to trample the sanctuary and the host underfoot. They're going to trample down two things. How long shall be the vision concerning the daily and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? That's the question. And what's the answer? Undo 2,300 evenings and mornings, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed, right? This is the Mari vision here. You with me? It's a question about how long is this prophetic history of the trampling down of the sanctuary and the host, but the answer is the Mari vision. When it's all said and done in 1844, then the sanctuary is going to be cleansed. And in your notes, in the center of page 20, under cleanse, made right, that's the subtitle. The word cleansed in verse 14 is Strong's 6663, Sadak. It's a primitive root to be causatively make right in a moral or forensic sense, cleanse, clear self, be, do justice, justify, justify self, to turn to righteousness, the point here is that for the sanctuary to be cleansed, you can use the word cleansed, that's correct. You can say that that Hebrew word means under 2300 days, then shall the sanctuary be justified, that's okay. And Or under 2300 days, then shall the sanctuary be made right. And that's what I want to approach this verse from, is that in 2300 years, the sanctuary would be made right. And you read it in the definition there, that isn't stretching the Hebrew word. Under 23 evenings and mornings, then shall the sanctuary be made right. And in the scriptures, the modern theologians will correctly tell you that in the scriptures, wherever the sanctuary is found, it's automatically understood that the host, God's people, are connected with it. All right? They can't be separated. And below that, in, below the definition there from Exodus 25.8, the purpose of the sanctuary is it says, and let them make me a sanctuary that I might dwell among them. The purpose of the sanctuary is that God's people could dwell with God, right? That God might dwell with his people. So you can't separate the sanctuary from the host. No way. And in verse 13, the question is, is how long is the sanctuary and the host going to be trodden underfoot? by paganism and papalism. We're not studying paganism and papalism here. But that's the correct question. So the answer is, in 1844, the sanctuary is going to be made right. And what I'm telling you, in order for the sanctuary to be made right, not only does the sanctuary have to be restored, but the host has to be restored. They both have to be restored to make it right. You follow me? It's not enough just to restore the sanctuary the purpose of the sanctuary, that he might dwell among a people, a host. So, now we're ready to look at this. In verse 15, after Daniel sees both the Chao Zone and the Mare vision, in verse 15 of Daniel 8, it says, And it came to pass when I, even I, Daniel, had seen the vision. That's the Chao Zone vision. When he'd seen verses 3 through 12, the visions of the Medes and the Persians and the Greeks and pagan Rome and papal Rome when he'd seen that vision of prophetic history and sought for the meaning, Daniel wanted to understand what that vision of prophetic history was all about. When he'd seen the child's own vision and sought for the meaning, then behold, there stood before me the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Uli. Who's the man's voice between the banks of the Uli? It's Palmoni, the wonderful number. It's Christ. And he said, which called and said, Gabriel, who's Gabriel? He's the head angel, right? Almost. Michael's the head angel. But what I want you to see is who's ever telling Gabriel what to do here is above him in, in the hierarchy of heaven. Gabriel, make this man to understand what? The Mare vision. See, verse 15, Daniel wants to understand the Chow Zone vision. But Gabriel said, make him to understand the Mare Daniel wants to understand the prophetic history that begins with the Rams, the Medes and the Persians, and goes all the way through Papal Rome in verse 15. But Gabriel's commanded, make him understand the vision of the evenings and mornings of Daniel 8.14, the central pillar and foundation of Adventism. You with me? 
So that's Gabriel's job assignment, correct? All right. Now, do we know that Gabriel is the one that instructed Daniel? Yes. Yes, <laughs> yes we know that. Who else did Gabriel instruct? John. Upon the testimony of how many is the thing is established? Two or three. So if Gabriel instructs Daniel and John, did Gabriel instruct Isaiah? Yes. He's the light bearer. He replaced Lucifer. He replaced Lucifer who had the job of bringing light. So he, it's Gabriel that instructed every prophet in the Bible. Correct? You see the logic? Unless you can give me evidence that there was some other angel that was instructing the prophets, I'll go with the testimony, the clear testimony of the Bible and spirit of prophecy is that it's Gabriel. Was Jesus a prophet? Jesus was a prophet. Who came to Jesus? Gabriel. That's the testimony of three. Okay, we got a testimony of three there. It's established. So Gabriel's instructed everyone that wrote anything in the Word of God. So he knows the whole Word of God. Right? That's why it's... No, I won't go there. Um, verse verse uh, 16. Gabriel's given the job assignment of making Daniel understand the Mari vision of the 2300 days. And in verse 17 it says, So he came near me. Gary, Gabriel came near Daniel. He came near where I stood. And when he came, I was afraid and fell upon my face. And he said unto said unto me, Understand, O son of man, for at the time of the end shall be the Chow's own vision. What's the Chow's own vision? It's the vision of prophetic history. And what does Gabriel tell him about this vision? It's, it's at the time of the end. Notice verse 26. Verse 26 talks about the Chow's own vision. It says, And the Mare vision of the evening and morning which was told you, it told is true. Wherefore, shut up the Chow's own vision, for it shall be for many days. The Chow's own vision, it's going to be sealed up for many days. It's going to be sealed up for the time of the end. That's Daniel 12, isn't it? This vision is the one that gets sealed up. So the first thing that Gabriel does when he comes to Daniel, Daniel's wanting to understand the Chow's own vision, and Gabriel says, just set that aside. That's that's not relevant till the time of the end. My job assignment is to make you understand the Mare vision. Okay? So in verse 18 it says, Now as he was speaking with me, I was in a deep sleep on my face toward the ground, but he touched me and set me upright. And he said, Behold, I will make thee know what shall be in the last end of the indignation. For at the time appointed, the end shall be. So... Um, I am now looking for page 21. If you realize, what, and I think there's, a, there's something that I want, I want to put out here for those of you that understand this. I often hear at this point, what, Gabriel's did, brother, what Gabriel just did, brothers and sisters, is he's told Daniel... And Daniel understands the 2520s. Don't ever doubt it. Okay, if we had time to just deal with the 2520 in relation to Daniel, you just go to Leviticus 26. Leviticus 26 has a formula. A formula for those Jews that found themselves scattered. It says if you find yourself suffering under the scattering of God, then you need to do this prayer. And it, it outlines the prayer that needs to be done to end the curse of the seven times in Leviticus 26. And you read the, the last passage of Leviticus 26 where this command is given and you outline it and then you go to Daniel 9 and you look at his prayer and Daniel 9 is a point-by-point -point fulfillment of Leviticus 26. Daniel knew they were suffering under the 2520 and he was fulfilling the command of that prayer to the very letter. Don't let anyone tell you that Daniel didn't understand the 2520. The book of Daniel is full of the 2520. Nebuchadnezzar is about the 2520. Belshazzar is about the 2520. Daniel 12, the, the scattering of the power of the holy people, it's about the 2520. This is about the 2520. The two indignations is about the 2520. The oath of Daniel 9-11 is the 2520. In the midst of the week is the 2520. 
Daniel understood the 2520. Okay, he, he flat did. So we often, I think perhaps incorrectly, what we do here is we say that when Gabriel comes to him in verse 19 and says, Behold, I will make thee to know what shall be in the last end of the indignation, we say this. There are two indignations against God. The one begins in 723 B.C., goes for 2,520 years, and ends in 1798. That's the first indignation, but the last indignation is the one that begins in 677 and ends in 1844. That's the last end of the indignation, and we say, see there, and I've done this often, see there what Gabriel does here in order to make Daniel understand the Mari vision of Daniel 8.14, in order to fulfill the command to make Daniel understand the vision of the evenings of morning and mornings of the 2300 days, Gabriel gives a second witness to 1844. And that's true, but that is the first argument. And it shouldn't be dwelt upon. It should be dwelt upon, I guess. But the people that are fighting this message, they seem to think that that's a bad argument, and it's not. But if they only get to that argument, to me, they're missing the real punchline. Because that's what Daniel's doing here in verse 19. He's saying there are two indignations, two 2520s, and the one it is the last is the one that ends in 1844. So he's given Daniel a second witness to 1844 because he's been commanded to make Daniel understand. And he's the one that's told every prophet the principle that upon the testimony of two or three is a thing is established. So Daniel, Gabriel is using that principle to prove that point. But the real bottom line here is, is that the 2300 years is identifying the restoration of the sanctuary and the 2520 is identifying the restoration of the host. And both of them must be restored in 1844 in order for the sanctuary to be cleansed, to be made right. That's the real punchline that he's showing there. The indignation has to cease. Yep. All right. Now, now, if you're not familiar with the indignations, I'm gonna, you're there in your notes. I don't have to tell you to write them down. If you're not familiar with the indignations, there's an indignation against God's people in the Bible and an indignation against the wicked at the end of the world in the Bible. You'll see some references to the seven last plagues when God's wrath is poured out upon the wicked at the end of the world. Isaiah 26, Revelation 16, Daniel 12, 1 through 3. But there's also an indignation against God's people that is a subject of prophecy. I'm on page 21 of your notes, if you're not sure. And the indignation against God's people can be seen in Lamentations 2, verses 1 through 9, Ezekiel 22, Deuteronomy 29, and other places. So what Daniel's, what Gabriel's doing is he's coming to Daniel and he's explaining that in order for the sanctuary to be made right in 1844, not only does the sanctuary have to be restored, but the host has to be restored. And, all right, now, I have a personal rule of thumb. I'm seeing more... More than two people yawning here, and I don't know, necessarily believe that it's my, my voice. It could be, but it's probably just because we just ate lunch, all right? So you have to take a deep breath. We're just getting started in this presentation, all right? Okay, so what, I, what am I saying here? I'm going to summarize this or bring it to a conclusion and move into another point. I'm saying that 1844, which is the 2300 years, which is the foundation and central pillar of Adventism, is it's absolutely incomplete without the 2520. You cannot cleanse the sanctuary unless the host is restored. Can't be done. Do you follow the logic? The 2520, the, I'll throw this out there. The 2520 is the second angel's message. Amen. Okay, the 2520 is the second angel's message. <laughs> what is he talking about? Brothers and sisters, what is the second angel's message? Come out of her, my people. Come out of Babylon. And what message in the Millerite history was it that gathered the people? It's the 2520. 
How many years does it take to gather that host? 46 years from 1798 to 1844. What brings them out of Babylon is the gathering of the 225-20s from 1798 to 1844. Okay. That needs to be understood if you're going to rightly, rightly divide Revelation 18, verse 2. Okay. And that's, that's backed up by the story of Nebuchadnezzar seven times and the story of Belshazzar seven times. Call out of Babylon is the 2520. It's the gathering of God's people. They have to be gathered. Okay, now, okay, I didn't intend to go there and, and, and I really don't have the notes prepared to defend this for those of you that haven't studied this, but some of you have studied this so you will follow along and understand it and other of you will have to test it on your own initiative, okay? In 1798, the first 2520 ends. 46 years later, the second 2520 ends. God has restored the sanctuary. Christ moves into the most holy place. What's he move into the most holy place to do? On page 21, the bottom, the last, the last Quote says, the coming of Christ is our high priest to the most holy place for the cleansing of the sanctuary brought to view in Daniel 8, 14. The coming of the Son of Man to the Ancient of Days as presented in Daniel 7, 13. And the coming of the Lord to his temple foretold by Malachi are descriptions of the same event. And this is also represented by the coming of the bridegroom to the marriage described by Christ in the parable of the ten virgins of Matthew 25. This is just four prophecies here. She's mentioned four prophecies. There are others. But all of these prophecies are fulfilled on 1844, and they're all emphasizing different truths. Christ came in 1844 to begin the judgment, right? We, we believe that. But he also came to receive a kingdom. And when does he receive the kingdom? Okay, now someone was, had gutsy enough to say 1844, but no, he doesn't receive the kingdom in 1844. Before he can receive the kingdom, the citizens of the kingdom have to be made up. Right. Okay, he has to go through the investigative judgment and determine who's going to be a citizen of that kingdom. He doesn't receive, the kingdom isn't even established who's going to be the citizens of the kingdom until judgment closes. Right. And when's he set up his kingdom? 1844. 1844? Sister White says he sets up his kingdom during the latter reign. Okay. So, so uh, the reason I'm throwing out these trick questions here, and I'm not giving you the, the passages in the spirit of prophecy, but they're there, is to just emphasize that what Sister White says here about 1844, these four prophecies are emphasizing four different things that happened in 1844. The sanctuary was cleansed. It was made right. The host was reestablished. The sanctuary was reestablished. The process of him receiving a kingdom began. And Malachi 3 was fulfilled. Look at Malachi 3. What's Malachi 3? Verse 1. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom you delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. Who's the messenger of the covenant? Jesus is the messenger of the covenant, right? And did he come to his, suddenly come to his temple during the week that he was confirming the covenant? Did Sister White take this verse several times and apply it to the two temple cleansings? Yes, she does. This is the history of Christ. Was he coming to confirm the covenant in that time period during that week from 27 to 34? So is he the messenger of the covenant? So who prepared the way for him to come? John the Baptist. But she just applied this to 1844. Did, did he come to his temple in 1844? Did he suddenly come to his temple? Wasn't he already in his temple? Isn't that the temple? The holy place is part of the temple, isn't it? 
this isn't talking about the transition from the holy place to the most holy place. This is talking about the work of him entering into covenant with the people. All right. So who was the messenger that prepared the way for him to suddenly come to his temple in 1844? Was it John the Baptist? It was, boy, was William, William Miller's in the Bible? Maybe if we realized William Miller was specifically marked in the Bible, we would have a little bit different attitude how we related to the work that was accomplished by him. Okay. William Miller prepared it. So, verse 2, But who may abide the day of his coming, and who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like a fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi, and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. What's it talking about? Was there a purification process in the Millerite history? That's a parable of the ten virgins, isn't it? Come at 50,000 by, by 1844, October 23rd, it's went down to 50. There was a purification process. He purified who? His people, but what's the passage say? who did he purify? The sons of Levi. The sons of Levi. Now all the prophets are speaking about the end of the world, right? So this history here in Malachi, it's talking about when Jesus came in A.D. 27 through 34. He suddenly comes to his temple. What temple did he come to in that history? The heavenly temple. He ascended to begin his work in the holy place, did he not? Is that not the coming that is being announced there? He's the, what did John the Baptist say the first time he seen Christ? Behold the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God that's going to be sacrificed, that's going to suddenly come to his temple and begin the work in the holy place. Isn't that what early writings 259 says? All those that would not receive the message of John the Baptist could not be benefited by the teachings of Jesus and that they were led still further to crucify him and they closed any opportunity, this is a paraphrase, to see their way into the heavenly sanctuary and receive the benefits that came on Pentecost. They could not see the change of dispensation from the earthly sanctuary to the heavenly sanctuary. Malachi is talking about Christ suddenly coming to the holy place to begin his work as the high priest. Where did he come in the history of the Millerites? In fulfillment of Malachi. To the most holy place. He changed dispensations. Wasn't that the problem with apostate Protestantism? They could not recognize that Christ had moved from the holy place to the most holy place. He had suddenly came to his temple. It's not about the second coming of Christ. It's about following the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. But what, what are the prophets speaking more about than the days in which they lived? Our day and age. Our day and age. So in Malachi 3, what's it speaking about? Where, what temple does he suddenly come to in Malachi 3 in our day and age? I'll tell you, it's a dispensation. The judgment of the living. And now Malachi is speaking more about the end of the world than the time in which Malachi wrote it, more about the end of the world than the time of Christ or the time of the Millerites. So the perfect fulfillment of Malachi 3 is in our day and age, and he's going to purify who? Who's he going to purify? The sons of Levi, right? Isn't that what it says? It doesn't say he's going to purify the 12 tribes of Israel, does it? Says he's going to purify the sons of Levi. Who's Levi? But where do we see a distinction about Levi that applies to the end of the world? Pardon me. A rebellion at Mount Sinai. The rebellion of the image of the beast. Everyone was worshiping the image of the beast, were they not? Yep. 
Except for who? And what, what was that rebellion of the image of the beast? If all the prophets are speaking about the end of the world, what was that typifying? The Sunday law. This is the purification that precedes the Sunday law and purifies the sons of Levi. It purifies those people in Adventism that at the Sunday law, when the image of the beast is in force, they're going to stand faithful for Sabbath. What happens to the rest of the camp? Okay. So, so brothers and sisters, at the end of Adventism, is there a work that is accomplished that the Lord makes up a host that he's going to enter into covenant with? Amen. Oh, yes. Okay, so he, he, had to, he had to make a host in 18... He had to restore the host in 1844. But he also had to restore the temple. And the 2520 and the 2300 are shedding light on our history. It's saying that at the end of the world, he's once again going to have to enter into covenant with Adventism that has been wandering in the wilderness of Laodicea. And he's going to bring them to a point in time when he suddenly comes to his temple. When does he suddenly come to his temple? Go to Acts chapter 3. We're not following our notes. Sorry. Acts chapter 3. This is another one of those places where the prophets are speaking about interesting stuff in their day and age, but it's more perfectly fulfilled in our day and age. In chapter 2, Peter's plainly told the Jews of that history that this is a fulfillment of Joel. Okay, but in chapter 3, verse 19, and you have in your notes, Great Controversy, page 611, the whole passage that I'm going to refer to is in there. Sister White says that this refreshing of Acts chapter 3, 19 and onwards, it's the latter rain. Okay, so in chapter 3 of Acts, verse 19, it says, Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. Brothers and sisters, when are your sins blotted out? The judgment of the living. Okay, the judgment of the living is... Why do you say that? Couldn't have Adam's, Adam's sins been already blotted out? Well, yeah, Adam's sins could be blotted out, but this isn't talking about dead people. It, could Adam repent? Now this is a call for people to repent. This is a call to people that are alive. Repent ye therefore and be converted. Dead people can't repent and be converted. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Well, when does the times of refreshing come? Latter rain, but when? Notice the next verse. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached to you. The latter rain begins when he sends Jesus Christ. 9-11. Islam is restrained. Paralleling August 11th, 1840, when Islam was restrained. August 11th, 1840, when Islam was restrained, a mighty angel of Revelation 10 descended with the little book of Daniel open in his hand. And Sister White says that angel is no less a personage than Jesus Christ. Amen. And it's prefiguring 9-11 when the mighty angel of Revelation 18 descends with the little book open in his hand. And that's no less a personage than Jesus Christ. When the latter rain begins, he sends Jesus. Amen. Do you know it beforehand? Does anyone know it beforehand that 9-11 is going to take place? Nope, he suddenly comes to his temple. To do what? To do what? To purify the sons of Levi. To prepare those that are going to stand in the image of the beast testing time. Okay, see, he has to develop a host here at the end, the same way he developed a host back in the Millerite history. If you don't understand that the 2520 is the prophecy of the gathering, Come out of Babylon. Come out of Laodicea, brothers and sisters. If you don't understand that prophecy, then you aren't there when he makes the sanctuary right at the end of the world. Because there was more than one thing that happened here. So what I'm saying, getting back to our subject, The 2300 years cannot be prophetically fulfilled without the 2520. Amen. They're talking about 
two parts of the same truth. Restoring the sanctuary, making it right, and you have to have the sanctuary restored and the host restored. And it's not enough to understand that that took place in 1844. It's more important to understand that that's repeated at the end of the world and that Christ is now calling his people to stand with Levi. Okay, so what I'm saying is, I'm saying a couple things. The 2300 years can't be separated from the 2520 any more than the 49 years can be separated from Leviticus 25 and 26 and that it has an application to the end of the world. Do you see the logic? You know, if it, you may see the logic, but you're telling yourself, yeah, I see the logic, but there's no way I could go out this evening and teach it to someone. He was just giving me too much information and, and you know, I'm not that familiar with the prophecies and I'm not so certain that, he, that everything he's saying is true. But I, I, I'm a, I use this logic I'm gonna use right here often when given opportunity. I hope you understand that if what I'm saying is true, then you need to go home and test it and make it your own. Because if it's true, this is something that you have to understand and incorporate into your experience. It's not just enough to sit in this room on Sabbath and, and feel blessed that you're hearing some new information, some new insights on the very central pillar of Adventism. And if you go home and you study it out and you find that this is error, is that gonna hurt you? So don't, even if you're saying, man, he's giving me too much information, he's been studying these things longer than me, I don't know that I'm gonna be required to understand this. Don't let those thoughts come into your mind. Okay, Christ is raising up Levi for the Sunday law Amen. right now. That's what he's doing. And what, how does he raise up Levi? What does he have to do? You have to purify him, brothers and sisters. Laodicea needs to be purified. I need to be purified. You need to be purified. This is the call to come to the purification. Okay. Um, let's switch gears. Another, I, I, we started it, started a little bit after two. It's three. Okay. So go to your notes on page page uh, 19. The 2300, this is about restoring the host, I'm going to say. There may be a better way to express this. The 49 years is about the work that God's people were given. And we're going to now look at the 490 years and we're going to say it's about the probationary time that God's people are given. And this is a fairly easy one to at least illustrate. Daniel 9.24 in your notes says, 70 weeks are determined and this word determined means cut off. Seventy weeks are cut off from the 2300 days for Daniel's people and upon the holy city to finish the transgression and make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. So this 70 weeks from 457 until 34 AD we're going to identify as probationary times. In your notes from Matthew 18, verses 21 and 22, it says, Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Till seven times. Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but unto seventy times seven. Forgiveness is measured out to be 490. Probationary time is 490 years. Go to Acts 13, Acts 13, verse 16 through 21. I'm aware of the arguments about this passage. I'm going to stand on this passage in spite of the arguments. Acts 13, verse 16 through 21. It says, Then Paul stood up, beckoning with his hand, said, Men of Israel, ye that fear God, give audience. 
The God of this people the God of this people of Israel chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt, and with a high arm he brought them out of it, and about, under, don't underline, but underline in your mind the word about. I'll acknowledge that it says about. The time of 40 years suffered he their manners in the wilderness, and when he had destroyed the seven nations in the land of Canaan, he divided their land to them by lot, and after that he gave unto them judges about, Underline it in your mind, the space of 450 years until Samuel the prophet. So without arguing whether it's actually 490 years right on the nose, Paul is saying, is saying to us that the history from Passover to Samuel is symbolically at least, prophetically represented as 490 years. Isn't that what 40 and 450 adds up to? Okay, that from coming out of Egypt, 490 years were determined for Israel, were cut off for Israel. What happened at the end of the 490 years? It's in your notes, 1 Samuel 8, 5 through 7. According to Paul, those 490 years ends with the history of Samuel. And in Samuel it says, And he said unto me, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons and said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people and all that they say unto thee, for they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. What happens here at the end of the 490 years? Ancient Israel, what? Rejects God. Probationary time over. Okay, and what does Samuel do? Well, some of the things he does is he anoints Saul, the first king, and David, the second king, which leads to Solomon, the third king. And when we get down here to the last three kings, Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, and Zedekiah, the Bible chronologists tell us that from Saul to Zedekiah, is 490 years. Okay, now there, there is a way I won't show you a second witness to these two 490 years when you look at the 2520, but it's beyond the scope of this study. But you can show this 490 years without going to the Bible chronologists. Go to Second Chronicles 36, 21. Thirty-six twenty-one. This is a really key verse, by the way, brothers and sisters. <coughs> to, fulf to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths, for as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill threescore and ten years. Now, if we read read the history that leads up to verse 21. It's the history of Jehoiakim, Jehoiah's kin, and Zedekiah. It's the history of Nebuchadnezzar coming against three, these three kings and finally the total destruction of Jerusalem. And Ezra, the author of Second Chronicles here, is telling us in verse 21 that What's being fulfilled here with their carrying into captivity is Jeremiah's 70 years. Daniel in Daniel 9 2 said he understood by books the number of years, the 70 years. Jeremiah specifically marks the 70 years twice in his writings, and in Ze Zechariah 1 12, the 70 years is marked, and it's the 70 years captivity in Babylon. But here, Ezra is telling us that this 70 years of Jeremiah, is based upon what? Leviticus 26, 34, 33 and 34. Leviticus 26, 33 and 34. 30, verse 33 says, And I will scatter you among the heathen and will draw out a sword after you, and your land shall be desolate and your cities waste. Then shall the land enjoy her Sabbaths, as long as it lieth desolate, and ye be in your enemy's land, even then shall the land rest and enjoy her Sabbaths. 
when they are scattered, the land will enjoy its Sabbaths. And this is from Leviticus 26 that Ezra is connecting Jeremiah 25, 12, the 70 years. Ezra in, in 2 Chronicles 36, 21 is saying that Jeremiah 70 years, right in here, this 70 years, that this is based upon Leviticus 26, 34. So how long does the land enjoy its Sabbaths? For 70 years. That's 70 years of Sabbaths. Okay, if you're going to have 70 years of Sabbaths, how many years of disobedience do you have to exist to desecrate 70 years of Sabbaths? Four hundred and ninety. This seventy years conclusively proves that it was preceded by four hundred and years, four hundred and ninety years of disobedience. But more importantly, it proves that Ezra, Ezra, who I believe understood the Hebrew better than any modern theologian understands the Hebrew, that Ezra is taking the passage in Leviticus twenty-six. And he's applying it with the year-day principle of Bible prophecy, just like William Miller did. So this argument about Hebrew doesn't square with the Bible. So, 490 years, 490 years, 7 times 70, to forgive people, it's talking about probationary time. And when the probationary time ends, in this history, what happens? Someone else, did someone say that? Yeah, judgment, judgment. But how, how is the judgment carried out? What's the symbol of that judgment? Seventy. It's the destruction of Jerusalem, isn't it? And, what's, and someone said seventy. In this history here, Jerusalem is being destroyed, is it not? Okay, so in this history, the 490 years, the 2300 year prophecies, 490 years, when you get to to 8034, what's happening? Israel's divorced of God, but what happens? Jerusalem's destroyed. Jerusalem's destroyed. And in great controversy, Sister White tells us that the Lord, in His mercy, extended the destruction of Jerusalem for, she says roughly, she doesn't use the word roughly, 40 years. Okay, in AD 34, it would have been okay. The Lord had the right to destroy Jerusalem in AD 34, but in His mercy. And when she speaks about it in Great Controversy, she said there was children of the Jews that hadn't heard the message. So in His mercy, He extended this probationary time so that the Jewish children had opportunity to hear the message of the disciples. But He put off the destruction of Jerusalem till when? The destruction of Jerusalem is marked by the number 70. The destruction of Jerusalem is marked by the number 70. This destruction of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar is prefiguring the destruction of, the Jerusalem, of Jerusalem by the Romans. The number 70 is attached to it. But what does Sister White say the destruction of Jerusalem represents? What part of the end of the world? The seven last plagues. The seven last plagues. And what, what follows the seven last plagues? The Jubilee. The thousand years. The seventh thousandth year. And what is it that the day is as a year? A thousand years. Okay, the seventh millennium is based upon Leviticus 25, verses 8 and 9. It's the land resting in the seventh year. And the land resting rests for 70 years here. That last millennium, that seventh millennium, is represented by the number 70. And it's preceded with the destruction of Jerusalem, which is the seven last plagues. You see it? The destruction of Jerusalem is connected with the number 70. But, but where do we derive the 70 years that is connected with the destruction of Jerusalem. What prophecy does that come from? 
Leviticus 26, 34. Leviticus 26, 34, in conjunction with 2 Chronicles 36, 21, Daniel 9, 2, Jeremiah 25, 12, Zechariah 1, 12, teaches us, teaches us that it is the 25, 20 prophecy that is used by the Holy Spirit to illustrate, to establish the 490 year time period of the 2300 year prophecy. Do you follow the logic? Perhaps? It's there. It's there. The 490 years comes from Leviticus 26, brothers and sisters. If you throw out Leviticus 25 and 26, you're throwing out the 2300 days, even if you don't know that you're doing it. Just like if you throw out the 49 years. So what is this 490 years? Well, it begins at Passover for the Jews until Samuel. But here it begins at the third decree. And the third decree we've already lined up with the third message in 1844. And it goes till when? This is us at the end of the world now. Not, not in literal time. What does it, this 490 years, I'm saying represents the probationary time of Adventism, which is portrayed in various ways in the scriptures, such as four generations. This is the probationary time of Adventism. When does it end? Pardon me? In Daniel 12.1, that's a good one. In Daniel 12.1, does probationary time end in Daniel 12.1? What happens in Daniel 12, 1? When does he stand up? When does Daniel, when does Michael stand up? When does Michael stand up? At the stoning of Stephen, doesn't he? Okay. Now, in Eatonville, I only have one more thought, and I'm only five minutes over from when we started. Okay, if I can find this. I haven't seen it today, so I don't think I can find it. I'll refer it to you. It's there. In Great Controversy, when Sister White talks, I've already mentioned it, when she speaks about 8034, she says, the Lord in His mercy extended that time period that the children of the Jews could hear the message. So Michael had stood up in AD 34, but he didn't carry out the judgment until AD 70. There was at least four people that were in Eatonville last weekend, right? Those of you that were in Eatonville, do you remember me reading that quote? Raise your hand if you do. Oh, there's more than four, there were six. So yeah, it's right there in the first chapter. Okay, so it's there. From there, where we went in Eatonville, it was this. The quote where Sister White says the time of God's destructive judgment is the time of mercy for those who have never known the truth. His hand of mercy is stretched out still. And it says hand of mercy, just like it was talking about the Jews in the 34 to 70 time period. His hand of mercy is stretched out still to save while the door is closed to those that would not enter it. So there is a sense that AD 34 in this history is definitely marking when Michael stands up in the close of human probation, but it's showing a double probationary close. First for Seventh-day Adventists, for Israel, and then there's time while they're children, and for us, that's those outside of Adventism have opportunity. So this 34 AD in our probationary time, it's encompassing the Sunday law for us to Daniel 12.1 for the whole world. Understand the logic? Amen. This is talking about the probationary time that we have. So what, what I've done is this. Okay. I, I hope you I hope you get it. I guess. Page twenty-seven of the Great Controversy. 
The other one, I don't know, I can pull it up for you about the time of God's destructive judgment is a time of mercy for those who have not known what the truth is. 8T, page 41. Okay, so what I've done is this. I, I'm, I'm eight minutes over. What I've shared with you is this. Focus in. We'll try, to, we'll try to bring this in in advance of the final presentation. We have demonstrated to anyone that's willing to see that the year-day principles of Bible prophecy that we often refer to are representing rebellion of God's people at the beginning of their history and at the end of their history. And the rebellion is always manifested against a type of rest. Here, the rest of grace, the rest of obedience. They could not enter the promised land. Here, in Jeremiah 17, they are rebelling against the seventh-day Sabbath. Ancient Israel is the perfect illustration of modern Israel, and it's identifying God's people at the end of the world, where once again they're confronted with a year-day principle, the year-day principle of Leviticus 25 and 26. And there's a group that are going to reject this understanding and in so doing, they're refusing to walk in the old paths of Jeremiah 6.16. Because the old paths are these truths which identify the 2520, both places. And the 2520 derived from Leviticus 25 and 26 is once again a rest. It has to do with the resting of the land and the jubilee. This rebellion that begins on this subject with the 2520 leads to a shaking in Adventism. We will not walk therein. We refuse to hearken to the sound of the trumpet, and the sound of the trumpet is also based upon the old past, because the fifth trumpet is Islam, the sixth trumpet is Islam. It takes not, nothing more than a child to know that if the first trumpet is Islam and the second trumpet is Islam, the third trumpet is Islam. Okay, so they won't hearken to the sound of the trumpet. They won't return to the old past. But the symbol of this rebellion is the 2520 of Leviticus 25 and 26. It's once again the rest. You shall find rest for your souls if you walk therein. And in the rebellion that ensues, once this message is brought to Adventism, those of us that continue in this rebellion, not just in the intellectual understanding, rebelling against that, but we can have the intellectual understanding, we can have the chow zone, but we can rebel against the mare. Amen. We can have the understanding, but refuse to bring our experience into agreement with that light. Those of us that continue in any kind of rebellion in this time are preparing a character that's going to repeat this rebellion against the Sabbath at the end of ancient Israel, at the destruction of Jerusalem, at the third test, the test of Zedekiah. Jehoiakim, Jehoiakim, and Zedekiah. At the third death, Jerusalem's destroyed. So we went in and showed you that Leviticus 25 and 26 is once again the year-day principle that's being the test for us. And then we've been going through and showing you that the prophecies of the 2520, of Leviticus 25 and 26, are the very prophecies that the Holy Spirit has used to construct the 2300-year prophecy. And we showed you that the first prophecy of the 2300 years, emphasizing the work of God's people to restore the old past, the streets, the wall, the law of God, in the troublous times of Islam, that this 49 years is nothing more than a repeat of Pentecost, the Feast of Weeks that leads to Pentecost, that leads to the work of Ezra, numbering the people, reading the law, sealing the people, this is based upon Leviticus 25. Then we showed you that you can't have 1844. You can't have the 2300 days to be fulfilled. It can't be cleansed unless you have the 2520. It doesn't, it doesn't mean anything to restore the sanctuary if there's not a host there with it. The sanctuary is not complete without a host. So if you're going to have the 2300 year prophecy, you have to have the 2520 with it. The host has to be gathered. It ha Levi has to be purified and prepared for Aaron making the image of the beast. Then we went to the 490 years and showed you that this probationary time that was given to ancient Israel that ends with the destruction of Jerusalem and the number 70, that it's there in this history, but it's also here in this history 
of the destruction of Jerusalem. And this history, according to Ezra in 2 Chronicles 36, 21, and Jeremiah 25, 12, it's based upon Leviticus 26, 34. It's pointing forward to this history, the stoning of Stephen, and to our history, the Sunday law and Michael standing up. So what we showed you is that three of these four prophecies are derived from the 2520. And to throw out the 2520 is to reject this call to enter into the promised land. It's to take sides with the 10 false spies instead of listening to Joshua and Caleb. And in our next one, we'll consider this week where he confirms the covenant with many, hopefully. Shall we pray? <clears throat> Father in heaven, we understand that you're doing a work among your people, and it's a hard work. It's a hard work for us to put our priorities in order that we might not only take the time to study these truths that you're bringing to us, but bring these truths into our practical experience. It's difficult to relate to those that are unwilling to consider these truths. It's difficult to relate to the rejection and persecution that is rising over this message. We trust that you are leading, uh, that this shaking that we're entering into is designed for our benefit and our good. And we trust that as you told Ezekiel and Jeremiah that when they would eat the little book that you would give them a forehead of flint, a forehead of a diamond to stand against this rejection, against this persecution. We trust that this forehead of diamond is part of the seal that you're accomplishing in our forehead. Please be, help us be faithful to this message, faithful to this high calling. We once again pray for those in this community that are so vigorously opposing these truths. Ask that you'd give them a period of grace, a little more time, and open the door for someone to give them a word in due season that would make them stop and reconsider the direction that they're going. We thank you for being with us throughout this Sabbath. We ask for your continued blessing as we bring these things to a close in the following presentations. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat>